Now, how far does your gaming history go? Like, how how far back do you go back to video games? Like, do you go back to an Atari? Do you go back to the regular Nintendo? Do you go back to the Super Nintendo? Do you go back? How far does your gaming expertise go back to? Meaning you physically played and was there starting at this era. For me, I wasn't part of the Atari era. I played the NES era. Um, I wasn't, I was more so leading into the Super Nintendo era. You know what I mean? That was more so me, but man. So this video here is gamers who achieve the impossible. We're gonna check this out. If you knew, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button, join the fam. Here we go. For many gamers, seeing the credits roll at the end of a game is enough. Now I guess <laughs> save the beautiful dragon from the evil princess. Ah, <sighs> pure serotonin. For others, however, games just aren't difficult, stressful, or long enough. These elite gamers go above and beyond, creating their own challenges and proving the impossible is. It ain't hard enough because everybody pretty much cheats these days. You go get a code or something and it jumps you to the end pretty much. I know nobody, people rarely go through games anymore. You know what I mean? I don't know. They may do. I just don't see them. It's possible. From no jump Mario runs to building working computers in Minecraft. These are the gamers that achieve the unthinkable. <laughs> One magical carp. What is that? One of the coolest things Pokemon. in the Pokemon games is the evolution mechanic. With enough experience points, your weak little turnip can transform into a mighty flower. Or your tiny buff dude can turn into a bigger buff dude. While in 2019, one gamer by the name of JRose11 decided evolution made the games too easy, and that he was going to beat Pokemon Fire Red with a Magikarp. That's right, the ludicrously weak Pokemon whose only redeeming feature is that it evolves into a powerful Gyarados. Replacing his starter with a level 1 Magikarp using a mod, JRose began his punishing journey, and there were hurdles right out of the gate. For starters, Magikarp doesn't even learn an attack move until level 15. This means wow. that the only way it can deal damage is to exhaust all 40 uses of Splash, a useless move that does nothing. You see, when a Pokemon uses up all its moves, it's able to use Struggle. Struggle does very little damage and harms the user, but for large chunks of the run, J-Rose has no choice but to rely on it. This is particularly arduous towards the start of the run because if J-Rose visits a Poke Center to heal, it also restores all 40 uses of Splash, meaning he must use them all up again before he can struggle. J-Rose previously attempted the challenge on the original Pokemon Red, but sadly realized it was impossible part way through. This Does the graphics on this game really look like that? I thought like, Pokemon was like a modern game, like a newer game. You know what I mean? It was just what... It could have been that long ago where everybody was outside playing those Pokemon games, man, and people almost was getting hit by cars trying to chase Pokemon. Why does the graphics look like this, then? That's crazy to me, bro. And then you heard him say mod. I feel like everybody's using a mod. Now, I'm not too... Is that meaning they're, they're cheating or something like that, or is it just a mod for the game nowadays? Is that normal? Got to ask that question. The original Pokemon Red, but sadly realized it was impossible part way through. This is because in the original game, Struggle is a normal type move, and normal type moves cannot damage ghost Pokemon. And unfortunately for J-Rose, he found out all too late there are several unavoidable ghost battles in the game. In the remake, however, Struggle has no type and deals flat damage, so it can hurt ghosts. Before you go thinking that makes the run easy, however, consider j -Rose still has a terrible Pokemon with almost no useful moves and plenty of weaknesses. j -Rose even learns how Pokemon's stealth mechanics work so he can avoid difficult fights. Yeah, I didn't know this game had stealth mechanics either. In the end, despite being grossly overleveled, the final battle is ludicrously close. J-Rose manages to just barely beat the game's champion at level 99 with only 21 hit points remaining. Now that is a next level achievement. Speaking of leveling up, if you love playing video games in high quality, then you're gonna love this video's sponsor. In Real Air are hyper stylish augmented reality shades that allow you to plug in and game on a 201 inch mega screen, wherever you are. 
$79. In real air will take your experience. Conclusions. There's two mechanics that appear without fail in almost every Mario game. Ah, who, who else's favorite game is this besides me? This is one of my favorites, bro. I can go back and find, if I can find one of those, what they call the, the, the emulator games, and plug up to my TV to play this, bro, me and Queen will sit here and play this all night long. Are you kidding me? This is a classic that'll never die down. At all. Illusions. There's two mechanics that appear without fail in almost every Mario game. You jump, and you collect coins. Well, in 2018, legendary gamer GameChamp3000 decided this was too easy. And thus, what? she began her ridiculous journey to complete Super Mario Odyssey without jumping once. Luckily, Odyssey has a precise way of tracking your jumps. Once you beat the game, you can chat with the adorable Toadette, who tells you all sorts of interesting things about your playthrough, including how many times you've jumped. Now that GameChamp had a way of reviewing her performance, she got to work on the run itself. She mostly utilizes extreme parkour, like throwing your hat called Cappy and bouncing off of it while it's still airborne. While this looks similar to a jump, it's harder to judge, less reliable, and the game doesn't consider it a jump. When Game Champ gets Mario airborne, she must then execute some crazy wall kicks and dive bombs to get anywhere. After an amazing free-running adventure, Game Champ beat Odyssey only to find she had apparently jumped 29 times. Though this discovery was painful, Game Champ was no stranger to pain. She had previously beaten the Legend of Zelda game Breath of the Wild without climbing once, so she was at home surmounting impossible odds. She accomplished this by using her environment, carefully stacking objects, and taking extremely long routes towards important goals. Wow. When she was faced with a mountain, she'd painstakingly try to sideways shimmy up the whole thing, stopping if it looked like Link was about to enter his climbing animation. Needless to say, after that experience, Game Champ was no stranger to coming up with clever solutions. So, returning to Mario, Game Champ realized that, for weird programming reasons, Mario Odyssey counts speaking to NPCs as jumping. She theorized that this is because when you press the A button to speak, the game flags it as a jump before the chat box appears, which cancels the jumping animation. Devastated, she started a second, lonelier run, talking to no one. After beating the game again, Game Champ returned to Toadette for a gut-wrenching revelation. She had apparently jumped one single time. Oh. Worst of all, this jump was unavoidable. This was because one cutscene in the game ends with Mario on the floor, and the only method of waking him up being, you guessed it, jumping. <laughs> After composing herself, however, she thought of an ingenious solution. Multiplayer. In two-player mode, another player can control Cappy. One thing Cappy can do is poke Mario, causing him to bounce into the air. And guess what? This bounce is not considered a jump. Tearfully, Game Champ completed her third and final run, proving you could beat the game without jumping. And Mario never has to worry about skipping leg day again. Dang. A far-fetched goal. Minecraft is a sandbox game that tasks players with creating anything from whatever they find laying around. And I mean anything. A treehouse? Sure thing. A giant toilet? Why not? An entire city? Hey, follow your dreams. In survival mode, players are dumped into a great big world and tasked with, well, surviving. The world is vast and algorithmically generated, creating more spaces and room to play than most will ever need. All algorithms have their limits, however, and in Minecraft that seems to be about 12.5 million blocks away from where the player first spawns. At this point, the terrain generated starts to become erratic and strange, defying the rigid rules that typically- I never understood how they got into Minecraft, but I guess my parents never understood how I got into the video games that I got into. So, I, I just gave them a pass. I just don't understand this one. And I, I like games, but it's still hard for me to grasp the whole Minecraft thing, man. That whole wave. We control what the world looks like. Players in the Minecraft community have dubbed these strange fringes the Far Lands. Notch, the game's creator, commented that he thought it would be impossible to reach the Far Lands without cheats or exploits, which gamer Killo Crazy Man took as a personal challenge. In 2019, Killo set out on his long journey into the deepest recesses of the Minecraft world. For nine months, Kilo documented his adventure nine as he went, months. sometimes uploading multiple videos a day that were several hours long. The closer he got to his goal, the laggy- I don't care what nobody say, that's dedication right there, bro. Nine months. That's dedication. Here the game became. 
This is likely because the game was being forced to spawn in and keep track of more terrain than it was ever expected to. On June 19th, 2020, Killo became the first gamer to legitimately step into the mysterious wonderland the game intended to keep hidden forever. If each block roughly equates to a single step, and we assume the Minecraft avatar has an average height of 5 foot 10, that means Kello's journey to the Far Lands would equate to over 5,705 miles. That's twice the distance from LA to New York. Pretty unfair his real life step counter still reads zero if you ask me. <laughs> Emotional Damage Run The Dark Souls trilogy is widely considered to be one of the toughest modern franchises in gaming. Known for the tight combat, tough boss. Where are these games coming from? I ain't even heard of this one. <laughs> I've been out the loop too long. ...and nefarious traps. It's likely most gamers will see the iconic You Died screen dozens of times on any given playthrough. <laughs> that is, unless you're the Happy Hob, who in 2017 became the first person to complete each game in the franchise without taking a single hit. No, you heard me right. Huh? Not without dying, but without taking a single hit. It now, that's pretty hard now. That, now, it's going to be hard for me, for you to convince me that that person didn't cheat. Honestly. Like, how does a person do something like that? And we've all seen these videos of these gamers called cheating. So, that's going to be hard for me to, to, to believe. You made it through the whole game without getting hit once. If you've played these games, you know how nuts that is. Right. Some of the bosses in the third game have many quick and unforgiving combos, and Dark Souls 2 in particular is a very long game with some less than desirable hitboxes. Look, that one had a tight development deadline. Let's not pick on it, okay? After accomplishing this staggering feat, Hob decided it wasn't enough and attempted something masochistic to beat the three games hitless in succession. This means that if Hob got hit once, he had to go all the way back to the first game. And guess what? That happened. Several times. In one instance that is absolutely gut-wrenching to watch, during the final boss of the run, this happens. Oh. No! Oh, oh my <laughs> god! No <laughs> way! <laughs> oh, I'd have had to shut it off and go for a walk or something, bro. That, I'd have lost my mind. No way. Man, and I thought Titanic was heartbreaking. After stepping away from the challenge, Hob returned a month later reinvigorated. He used yeah. numerous items that boosted his damage output based on having a light equipment load and low health, which makes sense. If you don't plan on getting hit after all, what use is armor? After 12 total grueling months of pain, Hob finally did it becoming the first gamer to best the Notorious Trilogy without so much as a stub toe. 12 months, maybe he didn't cheat, bro. Listen, listen. Of course, his cruel and sadistic audience couldn't let him have this victory for five minutes before asking him when he would do the same with Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Demon Souls. Other games by Dark Souls developer colloquially referred to as the Soulsborne series. Eager to please and probably numb to the emotional pain at this point, Hob completed a five-game run in 2019 and a full six-game run in 2021. I know Elden Ring came out recently, but please, people, he's had enough. An extreme Mario thon. Doing stuff like that, like, bro, the, the stress level, the focus, like, that takes a lot of focus to do something like that. You see, he had to take a month off that time he got to the final boss and got hit. He needed a month off. Yeah, that's a different type of stress. Speedrunning may be all about beating a game as quickly as possible, but as god-tier gamers Chrism and Value 111 might tell you, that doesn't mean it's always quick. That's because at Summer Games Done Quick 2016, the two competed against each other in one of the most brutal competitions in all gaming, the 602 Rod. What's this that? gauntlet involves collecting every single star in Mario 64, Sunshine, Galaxy, and Galaxy 2, one after the other for a grand total of 602 stars. And shines, I guess. Mario Sunshine is weird. 
This run is, as you can probably imagine, vicious and takes tens of hours. Playing any four games back to back is hard, but these are Mario games. These platformers have been optimized to death. There are dozens of precise, tricky maneuvers in each game that are essential That's for playing close. quickly where one wrong input can cost minutes. And on top of all that, you have to do it knowing that another runner, just as good as you, is racing against you. The duel was nail-biting. Krezom was ahead for much of the run, but by hour 18 started the lag behind due to fatigue. Valu experienced a second win and doubled down, managing to bridge the gap between them. In the end, both players entered the final stage of Mario Galaxy 2 at almost the exact same time. The level is fittingly called the perfect run, and I can tell you from experience, it's hard. I've personally collected every star in Galaxy 2 except for this one. I simply couldn't do it. The level contains some of the most treacherous platforming Nintendo has ever devised, and to top it off, your health is reduced to one, so one strike and you're out. Grism and Valu, after over 21 hours in the gaming chair, began the level around the same time. They both dodged boomerangs, jumped clouds, and narrowly avoided lasers perfectly. In the end, Valu managed to win by just five seconds. Seriously, after 21 hours and 40 minutes of racing, five seconds decided the winner. Since then, the run has been further optimized with gamer Oddme achieving a record of 19 hours and 57 minutes in 2020. Still, I think everyone should tip their M emblazoned caps to Crimson and Valo 111 for their historic 2016 bout. That was one heck of a race, boys. <laughs> Hello Zelda, my old friend. If you've ever been a kid talking smack about your buddy's gaming skills on the schoolyard, you've probably said something along the lines of, Oh yeah? Well I could beat that game with my eyes closed. Perhaps you should put your money where your mouth is. Or where your eyes are? Either way, somebody did it. At Games Done Quick 2015, a speedrunner by the name of RunnerGuy2489 decided he was going to play the N64 classic Zelda Ocarina of Time blindfolded. That's right, for the entire run, Runner Guy wore a thick black blindfold and didn't peek out from under it once. Runner Guy relied heavily on two things. First off, his intimate knowledge and memory of it. He had run the game normally many times before, so knew its rhythm and pace well. Secondly, he listened carefully to audio cues. Certain sound effects trigger when monsters spawn in the overworld, when items become available for pickup, and when bosses are about to launch different attacks. Backflipping and sidestepping are also highly useful as Link always moves a set distance when he performs them. It should be noted like that- When you obtain that level of skill, you're god tier. That's, that's just a different level of skill right there. Fam! Blindfold? Bruh. Nah, you, you you up there. I don't ever want to play. It's, it wouldn't even be fun. I don't want to play against you in a game. That at the event, Runner Guy didn't beat the whole game. Instead, completing only the dungeons you could beat as Child Link. This was because he didn't have enough time to practice an entire run, and the GDQ hosts were, I think fairly, skeptical it could be done without running over the allotted time slot. Since then, however, Runner Guy has completed the entire game blindfolded on his YouTube channel and inspired other runners to do the same. In 2022, a runner by the name of Bubzio was even able to beat the game blindfolded in a blistering time of 35 minutes. Man, if I were Ganondorf, I'd find that pretty humiliating. <laughs> Conquering Everest. Eve Online is a massive, strange beast. Famous for its comprehensive in-game economy based on real-world money, the game has virtual nightclubs that rake in hundreds of thousands of dollars, and virtual spaceships worth what? as much as houses have gone up in smoke during massive space battles. This entry isn't about Eve's economy, however. It's about its size. As you can imagine, a game needs to be pretty massive to entice gamers to spend that much hard-earned cash in it. And boy, is Eve massive. Eve enjoys a mind-boggling 66,856 planets, of which over 44,000 aren't gas giants, meaning you can feasibly land on them. These planets are contained within 8,031 systems which players actively visit, and in 2009, one player decided to visit them all. This is Katja Say, a modern-day virtual space pilgrim. Journeying from system to system, Katja had to navigate the typical worries that face all EVE players, fuel consumption, equipment maintenance, and, of course, other players. Remember how I said that hundreds of thousands of dollars have been blown away in space battles before? Well, Katja completed her entire journey without losing a single ship. Considering that more than 750 ships are destroyed hourly here, that's quite the feat. 
In total, Koch's journey took an entire decade to complete, beginning in 2009 and ending in 2019. That means her journey saw two presidents, the birth, sale, and fall of Vine, and all set Talk about commitment. seven seasons of Game of Thrones. Yes, seven. All seven. We don't talk about eight. For their efforts, Katja was invited to the dev-only planet of Polaris, had an in-game space monument created in her honor, and made it into the Guinness Book of World Records. And to think, my parents said I'd never amount to anything if I spent all my time playing video games. Mine too. Mine said the same thing. Games ain't gonna amount to nothing. All you do is sit here. Man, I knew I shouldn't have listened. <laughs> Go broke or die trying. Mm. Remember when I asked you to name two things you do in Mario games, with jumping and collecting coins being the most obvious? Well, it's time to eliminate that second one, too. Mario player Sieve Gaming decided to deny Mario his capitalistic impulses in 2018 and see if he could complete New impulses. Super Mario Bros. U without collecting a single coin. While that doesn't sound too hard, this challenge is actually practically impossible. That's because Nintendo wants you to collect coins, the game's designed around buying power-ups and earning extra lives, they never dreamed anyone would try to avoid them all. As such, many areas of the game are so flush with coins, they simply can't be avoided. This meant it was very, very difficult for Steve to plan a route through the game. He'd often have to go back to an earlier level to pick up a power-up you aren't supposed to have later on, just to make coin avoidance easier. Like here, where regular Mario can't get through this area coinless, but many Mario can. Eventually, Steve reaches a fork in the road. This series of platforms covered in coins or this pipe which forces you to collect a single coin upon leaving. Unfortunately, C found that what this meant is that the smallest number of coins he could beat the game with was one. One. That's frustrating. While Steve was so frustrated, he went back to these platforms to see if he could figure something out. It was here he discovered an old speedrunning trick. By approaching a pipe in the exact right way from the side, it's possible to skip the animation where you get sucked into it. This meant he was able to leap up the side of the wall with the acorn suit, kick off at the right moment, glide, then boost into the side of the pipe, and he did it! Mario was able to beat Bowser without submitting to his capitalist traps. Great success, Comrade Mario! Dudes are not only geniuses, but legends, fam. Just dance? Being a hardcore gamer can come with a lot of health risks. For starters, there's repetitive strain, injury, stiffness in the shoulders, eye strain, lower back pain, back and problems. large butt, just to name a few. But what if I told you that some game marathons pose serious long-term threats to your health? Well, that's the price you pay if you're a dance maniac. This is Carrie Swadecki, and she holds the most physically painful gaming records ever achieved, because she's a Just Dance champion. If you're not familiar, the Just Dance games use motion sensing devices to track and monitor your real world dancing prowess. This means that unlike many long form gaming sessions, if you want to be a Just Dance bro, you've got to be on your feet and working your body for hours at a time. Swadecki first made headlines back in 2010 when she broke multiple records by playing Just Dance Revolution for a glute-busting 15 hours straight. The very next year, she broke her record by an hour, and two years after that, upped her insanity to the unthinkable, playing Just Dance Central for an entire 24 hours. I can't even stay awake for 24 hours. Now, at this point, I need to mention that no medical professional would ever recommend you exercise for an entire day. This much exercise can lead to what's called overtraining, which can cause extreme pain, fatigue, and the breakdown of skeletal muscle, which can have long-term damaging effects on the body. Still, Swadecki was not satisfied with the amount of pain she'd inflicted on herself. In 2015, she began an unthinkable endeavor to not just beat her previous record, not even to double it, but beat it nearly six times over. Why? That's right, from July 11th to the 17th, Swadecki did nothing Why but didn't her family stop her? dance, with a few sparse breaks, eventually racking up the insane time of 138 hours. That's the world record for the longest gaming marathon ever. For perspective, that's 100 hours longer than the longest Minecraft gaming marathon. Which game do you think would be harder on your body? Since that monumental achievement, Swadecki has remained undefeated, and what's more, she livestreamed the entire thing for charity. Forget Just Dance, if I'd tried to do this, I'd have just dropped dead. Control Freaks. What? 
All games have one thing in common. For the most casual of puzzlers to the most frantic beat-em-up, every game uses some kind of controller. For many gamers, a challenge run comes not from beating a game while collecting every item or never taking a hit, but simply by playing around with the input. Case in point, do you remember Donkey Konga? I bet you don't. It was a Donkey Kong rhythm game that involved bonking along to 2000's hit covers on a set of electronic bongos. And well, speaking of hits, here's gamer Benjamin Gwen using these ridiculous controllers to beat Ornstein and Smoth, one of the trickiest fights in the original Dark Souls. Yep, he even set his back button to trigger when his mic picks up a clap. Crazy, right? A lot of people can't beat this game normally. As you can see, he's mapped different areas of the bongos to different common PlayStation inputs. I'm a fan of the double bonk dodge roll right here to escape a heaping hammer and sickening spear of pain. That's not the only wacky Nintendo peripheral that has bested this series, though. <laughs> Zero Lenny shocked the world by beating Dark Souls 2 with a Wii Zapper. On theme, he used a crossbow the entire run. Absolute legend Lil Aggie, who holds the record for fastest time to beat the difficult samurai slasher Sekiro, decided to challenge himself not by using a funky peripheral, but his own funky feet. Despite the violence and monsters, this is still probably the most wholesome use of a foot cam I've seen this year. While all these peripherals and er, foot play is certainly impressive, nothing compares to our next lunatic. That's because a fittingly named Robotator managed to find a way to play Skyrim on a potato. Or rather, a collection of potatoes? How? Well, Robotator first attached alligator clips fed with wires to each potato. These wires were then fed into a makey-makey circuit board with each potato input corresponding to a specific key on a keyboard. He then attached wires connecting his fingers in another part of the circuit. Because electrical currents can pass through potatoes, this meant that whenever Robotator touched one, he was essentially completing a circuit, generating a potato keyboard signal. Wow. Now, Robotator couldn't do much like this, but he was able to have a Skyrim experience at least as competent as my grandma. Saving the top banana for last, I'd like to mention Super Lewis 64 <laughs> who beat Dark Souls 3 with some bananas and a similar setup to Robotator. Bet you never dreamed talented. There'd be a more Donkey Kong appropriate Dark Souls run than the Bongo one, huh? <laughs> Minecraft in Minecraft. What? We've already covered some of the amazing things that have been built in Minecraft, but nothing compares to this next creation, which is reliant on something called Redstone. Redstone is a rare material in Minecraft that can, in essence, carry an electrical current and transmit power from one place to another. Redstone is commonly used for cute little novelties like moving drawbridges or automatic farming machines. However, as Minecraft is the best-selling video game of all time, Redstone was bound to make its way into the hands of more determined individuals. You see, what some gamers realized is that if you're clever about how you utilize Redstone, you can essentially create working electronics in the game. And if you can find a way to create a screen, anything's possible. Take Redditor I Really Like Stairs, for instance, who was able to use Redstone to create a slow, albeit functional, game of Pong in Minecraft. And while this achievement is impressive, it can't compare to the Herculean effort that was recreating Minecraft in Minecraft. You heard that right. Taking Redstone to the extreme, ingenious gamers Sumiyuri, Uwerta, and Stack Double Flow got to work. Their gargantuan creation is made using absolutely no mods or hacks, just redstone. As you can see, the contraptions they created mirror real-world computer components, including a graphics processor, RAM, and memory unit. Inputs are delivered via an enormous controller and projected onto an even bigger screen. While the game is monochromatic and rudimentary, that's still Minecraft in Minecraft. The Minecraft facsimile includes a fully realized 3D world, 16 types of blocks, 32 items, along with plenty of mechanics found in the full game. Despite the wizardry and ingenuity of those involved, the Minecraft Inception machine is only able to render a single frame of the game every few days. 
Thus, the Intrepid team created a specialized server that runs the game at 10,000 times its normal speed, making their creation playable. Hopefully, I'll live long enough to one day witness Minecraft running in Minecraft in Minecraft. <laughs> Those were some big... Yo, this is crazy. Reason being for us, like he said in the video, man, the parents that told their kids they'd never amount to nothing. These dudes have taken gaming to a whole nother level, man. You just can't out here, just be out here just playing them. No, you got to take it even further nowadays. And they making good money doing it. Salute and shout outs to each and every one of them. You know what I'm saying? So y'all get at me in the comment section, bro. Let me know what y'all thought of this video, man. And uh, stick around and stay tuned. Till the next one, I'm gone. Peace.